Welcome to Talking Sock. I'm your host, Pete Davidson. Kay Yusugi has fashioned herself into a staple of Australian puppetry. Based in Sydney, Kay brings a true sense of joy to every performance, workshop, and puppet she brings to life. Kay is a powerhouse theatre maker, performer, and builder, trying to create as many opportunities for puppeteers in Australia as she can. Join Kay, a monkey named Chi Chi, and myself for a talk about puppetry in Australia, here on Talking Sock. Kay, welcome, and thank you so much for being on our little show. Oh, Chuck's Pete. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so much. Um, the way we met is pretty special, I think. Um, can you remember the way we met? Yes. You are one of the few people where I remember very clearly meeting you. It was at the Hunter Creative Arts Conference in 2016, mm. and I was running a professional development workshop for teachers on puppetry in the classroom. And I remember you were really keen, keen <laughs> and devo. So you were yeah. super keen and enthusiastic to learn about puppetry and you were completely devastated that you'd been booked into another workshop. Yeah, because I, was, I wasn't a primary school teacher and no. therefore they wouldn't let me do it. And I was no. like, how very dare you? I know, exactly. And I remember you came up to me and you said, I'm keen as a bean, sign me up. Yeah. And then that afternoon we sat and we talked and you actually helped me make a hat yes. out of nothing, out of paper. I think we made it out of a top hat that looked very cool. And I actually won the best hat that night, the Yay. conference dinner. That was very nice. Yeah. And then from there, we, we just kept talking and um, you ended up teaching me, uh, along with Catherine Hannaford, how to make my first puppet a year later mm -hmm. at the arts unit here in Sydney. And uh, it's been a ride and a journey and a pleasure since then. So, Kay, I'm going to start with another question for you now. Mm -hmm. And this is the question I ask everyone. But I'm going to adjust a little bit for you here. So mm -hmm. why puppets? But also, why puns? Why puppets and why puns? It's funny. I Okay, well, first of all, I love puppets. I absolutely love puppets. I think it is the art form which arguably encompasses all the others. In few other art forms do you have the opportunity to direct, to write, to build, to sing, to create music, to choreograph, and if you don't do all of those things, to collaborate with people who do. You can create your own world and they can be tiny worlds, they can be big worlds, and there's really no limit to what you could do. And it doesn't matter what you look like. <laughs> and I just absolutely love that. So um, in my career as a puppeteer, I've played a koala. I've been a cosmopolitan man in his mid-50s. Very nice. Um, I've been a toddler with hair that looks like french fries, because why not? I've been a monkey, a flying banana, a giant gorilla eye and foot. Very nice. Both. Okay, that's both ends of the spectrum. And a ferret, you know, just to name a few things. Wow. And I think the kind of puppetry I do is often uh, in the more comical or realm or for family audiences, though I have done things for adults, and who doesn't love a good pun? <laughs> it, uh, your show with Chi Chi, Chi Chi's Your Monkey Puppet, definitely yes. loves a good pun, and I think more so for the adults in the room while you're performing to children. It's, yes. it's great to just bring them back in, and that's good comedy. Thank you. Yes, uh, I remember we... I did a puppet show for a very good friend of mine, Catherine Hannaford, and she loves Egyptian Wedgwood. And Chi Chi came along and we did a little show for her. And Chi Chi is about six years old. Her comedy is very literal. When she heard that she loved, Catherine loves Egyptian Wedgwood, she had brought a wedge of wood from Egypt. And it, it you know, customs, it was a nightmare for customs in quarantine, yeah. but it was totally worth it. Totally worth so, it. So, you know, and uh, Catherine teaches STEM at high school. So what did Chi Chi do? She plucked some flowers to, and took all the flowers and petals off and just gave her the stems because she thought Catherine liked stems. Because, you know, it's a beautiful green stick. <laughs> it's a beautiful green stick. It's really lovely that you have this character that has all those nuances about her and it gives that puppet such a fulfillment of life within them, just that they have that that literal mind and, and that, that it becomes such a great pun for the audience. I think that's a really enjoyable part of your puppetry. Can you remember the moment that you knew puppetry was your thing? I do. Uh, 
it's really at the beginning of the puppetry journey. So I had been invited to a Christian holiday program in Bathurst and I went along and I had the best time. I just finished high school. I was 18 years old and I'd always loved making things. And the people, they said they'd love for me to come back the following year. And could I make a mascot for their youngest group, the kindergarten to year two group called the Cool Bananas? And I thought, I'll make a monkey. Yes. So I went to a library library just like the library we're in today. We are. we are in recording in a library today. Yes and I looked for a book on doll making and they only had puppet books so oh. I made a puppet and that's kind of how it started and I remembered clearly it wasn't the puppet itself it was just newspaper and felt and, Got it. and I'd kind of adjusted a Scottish clown to become you know, a primate, but you know, it, it, it worked. <laughs> but I think the most memorable thing was the connection that I had with people through this puppet that I'd never had just on my own. Yeah. And uh, so that was really special. And a few, you know, many years later when I'd done a show and it was about Bina, which is uh, the story of an egg that hatches into a caterpillar who just wants to fly. All she wants to do is fly. And in the end, she does. Mm. And I did this show uh, for a primary school. And afterwards, the teacher came up to me and said the, there was a child, a really young boy, who had come to their school only a few weeks before and he was a refugee wow. and he'd been having a really hard time and this was the first time they'd seen him smile. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's because he'd seen puppetry. And I thought, this is why I do the work I do. It's really, really joyful work and I really love it. Mm. Um, there's actually a quote that I'd love to read for you, if that's okay. Of that course. Kind of... She's done her research. Let's oh, do sure. this. Yeah, so um, it's this is from uh, a lady called Linda Acop, and um, she has a website called Sunny Bunnies, and it's her puppetry company, and she says, puppetry is an extension of oneself. It may be motivated by the need to explain, explore, embrace, or critique the human condition. It is still one of the safest ways to act out, act up, entertain, hmm. educate, commiserate, wonder out loud, unburden yourself, or release your feelings. It fulfills my need to see the good guys win and justice done. Wow. And that just kind of is like, yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of what's in that is why I love puppetry so much and they also say by the way that puppeteers physically are roughly about 15 years younger than they are in their real age and I think it's just because it's you know really joyful work and maybe you're connected to your inner child but you know it could be the elixir of youth it might be. Hey, we and um, you know we are we have to be athletic sometimes. We have yes. to be under desks and yes. you know crawling on hands and knees and yes. in I've costumes. I've been under steering spitting. wheels. I've been yeah. inside toy boxes, and you know yes, you you have. There's lots of different things. You work hard. Yeah. And can I ask, when you had that moment when you were 18 or, or so, doing those workshops for children, had you had any performance experience before then? Had I had any performance experience? I did drama in high school mm -hmm. and drama was very connected to, I guess, my whole um, education as a child because I came to Australia when I was three. I didn't speak a word of English and I watched Sesame Street pretty much to learn English, which is maybe why I have a character who has an American accent. and. Um, so puppetry was something that I had very early on. And because I didn't speak very much and I was like just painfully shy, there was a teacher who encouraged me to do drama. Mm. And I did speech and drama in primary school and then I continued doing drama uh, just for my own interest, not as a, um, like a high school certificate subject but I just loved drama so much. So I think that carried on. And uh, the thing about puppetry is rather than people looking at you, 
they're looking at some something else that you are putting your energy into and for someone who is naturally a bit more shy that was perfect mm. and i'm going to go a bit off piece here but um I'm about to ask you how you describe your practice, but mm. I actually want to really ask you, how did attending the London School of Puppetry mm. shape your practice? Um, because mm. since, you know, you've been doing this now a little while um, and you've developed your own sort of body of work here in Australia, but it, those foundation skills really came from London, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes, so doing the professional Uh, Diploma of Professional Puppetry at London School of Puppetry, what they did, and it was absolutely perfect for me at the time. I was still an emerging artist. I just finished my degree doing primary education at Sydney University. And I remember very clearly having uh, a chat with the Director of Studies, Caroline Astell Burt, who's now a dear friend of mine. Mm. And she said, okay, this year, is going to be about you taking off your teacher hat and we're going to explore everything as an artist. And that was a really great and interesting challenge to do. Mm. And what was wonderful about the course is the way it was structured, you would learn four different puppetry disciplines. So you would do shadow puppetry, you would do rod puppetry, uh, you would do marionettes, and you would do uh, what was glove, hand, and body puppetry. Wow. Um, Apart from that, we also did something called applied puppetry, where for a whole month, we would work with different um, artists from across artistic disciplines, filmmakers, someone in the opera, someone making a documentary, uh, musicians, and they had real projects that they wanted to incorporate and integrate puppetry into. And we would be given one maximum two days to come up with mock-ups. So you learned really quickly how to fire off ideas, how to collaborate with other people, um, how to make things really, really quickly, and to not doubt yourself because you just didn't have the time. And you just present yourself, and even if you didn't feel confident, you're just like, well, this is my idea. Gosh, it sounds like Project One Runway for Puppets. You yes. know, it's got that real intensity to it. Yes. And it, and it also sounds like the intensity of something like NIDA or Central St. Martin's in, in that, you know, that performance aspect that you just have to mm. learn every single form. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to find those four forms here in Australia, I think. Mm. I think, you know, over in Europe, it's certainly much more accessible to find marionettes and so that's the origin of it. Mm. But how have you brought those four forms back to Australia in your own way? Well... When I was at LSP, London School of Puppetry, what we had to do each for each module was you would have operating classes in those uh, different styles, but you would also be creating a five-minute show that had to fit into a suitcase. Ah, the illustrious suitcase. Yes. So you'd um, so the modules would go for a month long, and in that time you would have to create everything. And you could get outside help, but most of us, we just had to do it ourselves. And Mm. we learned how to be a jack of all trades. And I think by the time I'd come back, and I forgot to mention the sixth module in this diploma was business strategies for the puppeteer. So you had to think through how are you actually going to make it as a solo puppeteer? Or by the end of it, you would figure out Do I want to be a solo puppeteer? Do I want to be an ensemble performer? Do I want to specialize in making? But most of what I've seen at LSP is it produces um, artists who can be a jack of all trades because some jobs are purely performance. Other jobs are purely commissions. I'm currently making an egg puppet that wears a hat and has wings because that's what the client wants. And you know, yes, I can make that. Um, And then other times you will be running workshops for people. It's something that is one of my greatest joys is to share puppetry, especially with people who've never done it before. So I think the things that I've learnt from over there that I bring now is the knowledge and the skills that I learnt over there. I hope I share with other people. And in terms of also the work ethic, um, getting a thicker skin, you know, I went over there because I was tired of being told at the end of every puppet show, that was great. I loved it, but no actual constructive feedback. Ah, no critical. And I knew 
that was not great. I'd only been doing puppetry for a very short amount of time and I really didn't have any training and I tried my hardest but I just wanted someone to tell me straight without feeling like they were going to hurt my feelings. That was not great but here's how you can make it better. And um, let's make puppetry great again. No, let's do that. <laughs> let's take that well away from this conversation. Let's Thank that you. Well away. Um, it but... is definitely in the forefront of our minds, and we will we will leave that political atrocity somewhere else. But uh, oof, yes. yeah, let's put a wall up on that one. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, there's those kinds of things that I would I've brought back, and also especially that module on applied puppetry, learning how to do mock-ups and prototypes and doing it quickly and delivering and you know one of the things we had to do as students is organize a festival and a yeah. real festival liaising with artists liaising with schools and community groups we had to rent an apartment in london you know for three weeks and budget for that it was all real life stuff and with with the support of people who are in the industry and connections that you get from people in the industry. Mm, it sounds formidable. And so how long ago was that? That that was back in 2008, 2009. Wow. So we're 10 years on. We're 10 years oh, on. Oh, golly, are we? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Maybe even 12, actually. And so I oh, want to I'm ask you... I'm not very you, good at math, so I'm not even going to think oh, about that. Oh, I don't math. But uh, <laughs> can you tell us about... So now we're back in Australia and now we're a touring international puppeteer and puppet builder. Can you tell us about the experience of going to Jeju Island in South Korea and mm -hmm. how did you, that come about? How did we get to this experience? Okay, how did we come about? So I had never sought out to do this show. I feel like the show happened to me. Um, <laughs> and so I had been... Um, I'd, I'd been booked to go to a festival in China um, with Dream Puppets, which is a wonderful black light theatre company mm. in Melbourne, and I was going to accompany them, and I needed to get a visa. So I went into the city in Sydney to the Chinese consulate, and I noticed just a few doors down that there was the Korean Cultural Centre. And I'm half Korean, and I'd never been in there. And so I thought oh, I'd, I'd really like to check it out. And if you've never been to the Korean Cultural Center, it is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful place to go in. And the things, that the displays they have and uh, the traditional um, displays and arts, artwork and things is just wonderful. But they also have a library. And when I walked in, they had a whole bunch of magazines for free that people could take. Wow. And one of them had a really striking image of this woman, uh, just just a close up of her face, wearing um, like a wetsuit, a bright orange wetsuit with a glass um, goggle. It's it was just a one circular um, periscopic style yeah, goggle, yeah, glass mask on her face, and she was underwater, and she looked like she was in her seventies. And it was such a striking image. Mm. I picked up the magazine, was thrilled to hear that I could take it home, and I read it. <laughs> And I was so intrigued and surprised that I'd never heard of these people. You know, I, I was born in Japan, I'm also half Japanese, and I came to Australia when I was three. I don't really speak Korean, and so there's, I've always wanted to learn more about my culture, and I felt like this was a way to do that. And so uh, I'd gotten a, uh, some funding from the Seaborn, Broughton and Walford Foundation, the SBNW Foundation, which is in Sydney. And on a side note, if anyone is ever looking for funding and they are a performing artist or a performing company, they give grants twice a year in April and in October. So I'd highly recommend people to check that out oh, because they are absolutely fantastic. Mm. SBNW Foundation, I would not have a show without them. So I got funding from them and I went to Jeju Island and my mother accompanied me as my translator and my uncle her brother also came along to help us drive around the island wow. and we were there there was um, the Jeju Henyo Museum and it's really well designed there's video footage photos uh, displays so much information and I learned 
so much from them go through going there. But then when you're driving on the coast, you see these bright orange dots in the water and there are these women out there doing their work. And so I got to meet these women and that was extremely special. And I'll probably just give a little bit of background to who these women are and what they do. So Henyo, and for any Korean person listening to this, I apologize in advance, my pronunciation isn't great. But, um, <laughs> disclaimer. Disclaimer, done. done. <laughs> um, but yes, so Henyo are uh, women divers and most of them are in their 60s and 70s. Some of the oldest ones are in their 90s. And they free dive, which means they dive without any breathing apparatus. And they can dive between five to 20 meters. And they can hold up their, hold their breath for up to two minutes. Crikey. And what they do is they, they call themselves sea farmers. So they are farming the the bottom of the sea, finding shellfish and seafood to sell and provide for their families. And it's one of the only matriarchal communities in Asia, let alone the entire world. And I was so captivated when I'd heard about these women because not only because I just thought they're amazing because they are, but also what for me they symbolically they represent. In these women, you have these people who are so empowered, they're providing for their families, but also just really fragile, they're elderly, and they're trying to continue a tradition that's dying out. And I found that really quite moving. Mm. And when I compared them to the uh, rest of basically the world and how women see themselves, you know, where most women are obsessing about the size of their waistlines, these women are strapping lead weights to their waists to help them sink because they are going to do what they need to do to provide for their families. And I just thought that's that's so amazing. Isn't and it? I just I was compelled to do a show about them, uh, to so that the rest of the world could know more about them. And I'd found out to my delight that in 2016, they had been listed um, as UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage. Hey, so they have right. the backing now and more people are finding out about it. So it's not necessarily about saving the tradition because it is dying out, but it's about leaving a legacy. So I wanted to be a part of that legacy. And so visually, you created this show, and it was completely handmade, hand built. Uh, the puppets are mostly crocheted, yes. and they they have this absolutely gorgeous texture to them. And then on top of that, you perform this show with your mum, who then became your tr- your translator, then became a secondary puppeteer, who's also in her seventies, I think. And she turned seventy last year. Sorry, mum, I've just told the world that, but she looks fantastic. <laughs> Doesn't she? <laughs> And, and you guys were also wearing a similar sort of uh, uh, outfit that kind of helped ma- map the show as to where you were and what you were doing. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the visuals that you came up with and how your mother was so involved in that project. Okay, so you mentioned the crochet. So I uh, love crochet and it's, for those people not familiar with it, it's similar to knitting. And it's something that I had been doing on the side, uh, mainly as a hobby, but I'd always thought I love the sculptural uh, element of crochet and how you can really make anything. And I wanted to incorporate that with puppetry, especially because we were doing women's stories. I wanted to make the puppets in a technique that's uh, done predominantly by women and to celebrate that. And in terms of having my mother on board, she wasn't on board from the beginning, not because I'd excluded her, but it's just I'd had um, from the beginning just assumed this would be a solo show because that's just how I worked um, from up until that point. And I did actually make an educational version of the show that I performed for a grade one, grade two cohort, which they would be roughly eight to nine years old. And Mm. that was at a primary school. Um, But it didn't have the feel that I had wanted. And my mother, um, Yong, Yonggyu Kwon Yasugi, she has been 
by my side uh, in these gigs for years as a roadie, as an assistant. She was there as an audience member. And it just made sense that this is a show about passing down traditions. My mother needs to be in this show. Yeah. And I'd actually had a conversation with another very good friend of mine, Annie Forbes, who is from About Face Productions in Melbourne. And when I'd been telling her about this show, um, she said, I think you need to do this with your mum. And I thought, wow, Annie, you're right. This this is something I need to do with my mum. Because when, like, <laughs> when is there another opportunity to do a show about these women who look like my mom who are similar age it's about passing down a tradition and she was basically the cultural ambassador she was the one who had the language knew the culture and i had the puppetry so i passed the puppetry onto her and she passed her culture and language onto me and so i thought it was um pardon the pun a beautiful way to knit these things together ah, there, yeah, it is. there it is <laughs> oh that's there. so beautiful and i i love the idea of you know your mother being um you know talk about women who pass things on and, and farm and and nurture their mm-hmm. their children and their families this is exactly what your mum has done for you for so long and mm-hmm. i think it was so wonderful to see a show where you could see your relationship as well and so there was sort of two levels of experience in the show one was on a personal level knowing you but also that we knew that this was your mother and that this was a show you did together so it was really really amazing well we're going to take a little break so you are listening to Talking Sock uh, with One Orange Sock and Kay Yasugi we'll be right back after the break make sure you hit the subscribe and follow One Orange Sock Productions on Instagram and more with Kay shortly This is Philip Miller. I'm Richard Bradshaw. I'm Sue Wallace. And you are listening to Talking Sock. Talking Sock Podcast. The one orange sock production. This is the number one podcast for puppetry in the country. Your one-stop shop for all things puppetry arts and practitioners. The number one puppetry podcast in Australia. Follow this podcast. Welcome back. You are listening to Talking Sock with Pete Davidson and Kay Yasuji. Um, Kay, I want to talk about Unima. I want to talk about Unima Australia and, and your involvement as secretary. Tell me more about that and tell me about the Randwick Festival of Puppetry. Okay, so in terms of Unima, Unima Australia is the official puppetry organisation of Australia and it's the Australian National Centre of Unima International. And Unima stands for Union Internationale de la Marionette, which basically means the International Union of Puppetry. And to give you a little bit of a background, um, we currently have about 100 countries around the world connected with this organization. It started in 1929. It's affiliated with UNESCO and is a member of the International Theatre Institute, and its current headquarters are in Spain. Um, And the... So last year we celebrated the 90th anniversary of Unima International Mm. and in terms of Unima Australia, it was founded in 1970, which means this year we will be celebrating 50 years of Unima Australia. It's kind of a big deal, guys. It's kind of a big deal because we are the peak national body representing the puppetry arts. We basically love puppetry and we want to connect people with other people who love puppetry, who are puppeteers, who are performers, who are makers, who are enthusiasts, who are students, who are mentors, all different people, both in Australia and overseas. And we're currently sitting in about 109 members, I Roughly, think. Roughly, yes. Yes. So, you know, folks, get on board because we'd love to see um, Unimar grow this year as we believe puppetry is growing in Australia. Mm. And as, as this show is all about sort of canvassing the puppeteers that do exist that we know of, there are a lot of you out there who we don't know about. Mm-hmm. So give us a holler, let us know, talk to us on Instagram, talk to us on our websites and, and please look up Unima. I think it's a really great thing. And what have you been doing recently with Unima? So one thing that's super exciting is as of yesterday, we have 
just opened applications for the Laurie Gardner Unima Australia Biennial Scholarship. And so basically it's um, for up to 2,500 Australian dollars. And as long as you are a Unima Australia member for a minimum of two years um, and you are an Australian citizen or permanent resident in Australia, you are eligible. Mm. And so there were people who signed up two years years ago specifically so they could apply for this scholarship and so I'm really really excited this mm. is some um, this could be a plane ticket for someone to get training overseas um, to do an artisan residency to do a workshop at a festival there's so many different things that this could open up for somebody and so um, that's something that um, we've just done another thing that's coming up is the Unima International Congress it happens once every four years and and this year, it's happening in the Southern Hemisphere in Bali. Oh, my God. Puppet Olympics. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh yeah. I didn't think about that. So, um, so I'm also counsellor for Unima Australia. And so this will be the first Congress that I'll be attending representing Unima Australia, along with our other counsellor, Adam Bennett. How does that feel? It feels good. Yeah. It feels good. I think there will be a lot of different people to meet. Um, There'll be hopefully a lot of puppetry to see because there is a festival component added to it. And there's also going to be meetings and discussions about current projects and not just, you know, sharing reports of what we've been doing in Australia, but hearing what people are doing overseas as well and internationally and how we can help each other. So I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm real. And so recently you were an artistic consultant on the Randwick Festival of Puppetry. So this was sort of... an inaugural uh, baby festival that kind of came out of a conversation that you had with someone from Randwick Council. Can you tell us more? Yes. So the Randwick Puppet Festival is something that happened basically after... uh, So Dream Puppets, who I mentioned earlier, um, they're from Melbourne. They have been performing in Randwick for a few years now and they've always been very, very popular. And so... Richard Hart, who is the president of Unum Australia, by the way, he performed his show there uh, at the Randwick Literary Institute and a bunch of Sydney puppeteers went along and we met the wonderful, wonderful Avril Jeans from Randwick City Council. And she is also super keen on puppets. And she is a person who makes things happen. Ooh, and we okay. need more people in the world like her. And so she basically said she wants to put on a festival and she wants to do it quickly. Uh, you know, Dream Puppets, they performed in October. The Randwick Puppet Festival happened in January. So it happened super In like duper three quickly. months. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And she also, you know, I told her I'm going to be doing my show, Puppet Pandemonium, which is in Imaginata. I was performing at Imaginata, which is the Australian Puppet Centre in the Southern Highlands and Sutton Forest, run by Sue Wallace and Steve Coop from Sydney Puppet Theatre. And... She came down to see that show. Mm. And then we had a pub lunch with you. Yeah, I was there for that pub lunch. You were there for the fish and Uh. chips. And we just had a chat. And I think it just goes to show how important it is to go see shows, connect with people, eat with people and have a chat because you never know what could come out of it. Mm. A lot of my family keep telling me, Pete, you know, you need to stop socialising so much. You need to stop going to so many shows. It's just going to, you know, financially ruin you. And I go, don't you understand? This is work. Like this is networking. Going to a show means that you are liaising with your community and with liaising with you know your industry so yes. yeah go to shows folks um yes. and and things happen things happen and also go to shows to be fed to see things, to inspire you. And the great thing about festivals, and I'm not just talking about this one, but festivals in general, is you get to, you know, if you are not familiar with puppetry, um, I've described the Randwick Puppet Festival sort of like a puppet yum cha or a dim sum, as you will. It's a taster of all different kinds of puppetry. Mm. So Sue Wallace um, from Sydney Puppet Theatre and Imaginata was also an artistic consultant. And we both agreed that this first festival 
in Sydney for the Randwick Puppet Festival should be a taster because the community just doesn't know all the different kinds there are out there and a festival will be able to bring that to the community. So we had Blacklight Theatre, we had Rod Puppets, Marionettes, Shadow, um, Glove Shows um, and so we had all different kinds, Ventriloquism, hey. uh, Giant Puppets, and yes. that was Curious Legends um, from Newcastle. So you know, and, and you get to see things that you love, that you're inspired by, and you say, I want to have a go with that. I reckon I could give that a red hot go. Or you sometimes see things that you don't like, and that's also really good. Yeah. Um, sometimes you see things then you think, okay, oh, maybe, you know, with a bit more development that will grow. Because there was um, this element in the festival of presenting um, works that... Um, were new and other works that were established and very polished and so you get a whole bunch of different things and I think it's yeah. great not to just to see things that are polished but also see things that are still um, kind of in new incubating and, you know you see the and process marinating you know yeah. and so um, and then when you see it again later you know um, there's just a joy about it a great example is um, the quickening and that's uh, was a, a group um, led by uh, Gillian Waters and she had a show called Dionysia and I was, I was so sad I couldn't see it it was at the cabaret night and I wasn't available for that but from what I've heard you know this was a show that I had seen in its early development about a year prior and it was a Czech style um, black light uh, black, not not black light, black theatre show, and they had really developed it over that year, and it was just, from what I've heard, exquisitely beautiful, sort of like uh, eating a rich chocolate cake. It was decadent, and um, you were really fed and nourished and savoured all the beautiful details in this piece that had grown over a year. And festivals allow you to do that. Yeah. So. It's so important for artists and particularly us in our community to be able to feel safe and find safe spaces to present new and emerging work because it's terrifying. When you put a new work on the on the line, it is it is putting your soul on the line, I think, mm. as well. So the fact that Randwick, being its sort of in its first generation, had the forethought and you guys, you and Sue, to have that forethought to put that kind of element in there is so wonderful. But I feel like puppetry festivals in Sydney did exist a while ago. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Do you know? You've been in the game a little bit longer than I have. Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned Sue Wallace. She's someone that I looked up to a lot. And she was part of organising the One Van Festival in Blackheath for many years. And the big difference between that festival and the Randwick one was that festival was pretty much, as far as I understand, and I apologise if I didn't get the details right, but as far as I understand, uh, a festival pretty much organised by artists and, and by the puppeteers. And it was called One Van because people would show up in their van and do their shows. And it was really, um, from what I've heard, just the most wonderful festival, but also very difficult to sustain if you don't have uh, the people to keep it going. And the difference between that and say the Randwick Puppet Festival is this was a festival supported by a council. So they provided us with the venues, they provided us with even the graphic designer and um, communications and uh, social media support and volunteers wow. and sound people. They provide, you know, all of that so that it's, it wasn't just us putting it on. And um, I think that makes a really, really big difference and not that this was a festival but back when I was a child there was the puppet shop at the rocks and in the city I remember that and everything was, hang from the, hung from the ceiling yes it was like puppet caves wasn't it and there yeah. were marionettes hanging from the ceiling and there was a very small uh like cottage the puppet cottage right next door to it and they would have free shows every weekend and I, you know, I, I'm going to share that one of my first shows I ever saw was Sue and Steve from Sydney Puppet Theatre. And I saw them do their shows. And 
that's just how people saw puppetry. Um, that was one way to see um, live theatre in puppetry back then. And unfortunately, when that shop closed, uh, that whole thing sort of closed down as well. Mm. Though uh, it's a testament to Sue Wallace and Steve Cooper for for their determination and keeping the puppetry performance element going. So um, they organised Imaginata, the Australian Puppet Centre, and it first opened, um, as far as I know, at the Annandale Creative Arts Centre in Sydney, and they would do shows every Sunday at 11. And now they've since moved to the Southern Highlands in Sutton Forest, and they still, to this day, do a show, a puppet show, every Sunday at 11 o'clock. Wow. And so you mentioned Sue now, and I want to talk about the thought of the puppeteers and puppet people that you look up to. And obviously Sue seems to be one of those people. Yes. Tell us more about why you look up to Sue, apart from the reasons you've already shared and perhaps some other puppeteers that you mm-hmm. you admire. She has a wealth of experience, but she's also, like so many puppeteers I know, incredibly generous. I've never met a group of people like puppeteers who are so generous. I think that's yeah. why I've stayed in yeah. this community. When you say why why puppets, it's also because of the puppeteers. They're just really nice. <laughs> and I can call up Sue if I have a question um, about something that I'm doing and we'll have a great chat. We will even talk about glue and the things that, you know, what glue have you used and have you tried this? And, and she's just really helpful. But she's also... Um, she, you know, she she rehearses, she's really disciplined, um, and she is constantly performing, she, she does commissions for people, and she's been doing this um, for years. I, I'm going to say probably more than 30 years. Um, and so, you know, just to look up to someone who's been doing this for that long and uh, with such high quality work, and also not just doing her own shows, but working with other people, helping to direct puppetry in other shows. And a lot of the time you don't get to hear it because unless you are really on top of your social media and your newsletters and everything, you, you simply just don't have the time yeah. to share what you're doing. And she's incredibly humble, but I think so much of what the puppetry we have in Sydney is due to people like Sue who've kept it going. And so um, that's someone who I look up to a lot. What was your other question, sorry? Well, apart from Sue, is there anyone else? Yes. So uh, someone else who lives in the Southern Highlands is Richard Bradshaw. and The king of puppetry. <laughs> yes, and he has also been in the industry for a long time. We only just celebrated a couple of years ago um, 50 years of him being a puppeteer. And he has not only, you know, such a wealth of experience and skills as a shadow puppeteer, and he is probably the most famous puppeteer we have in Australia. Yeah. But Put he also map. has so much knowledge about Australian puppetry history. And we need custodians like that to share their knowledge of what has come before, especially for young people coming into the industry. Um, in order to look ahead, you kind of need to know what has come before. And he's one of those people that has that information. And again, he's incredibly generous um, with, and he just knows so much. So um, I really look up to him. Um, another person I mentioned earlier in the podcast, Caroline Astell Burt, Director of Studies of London School of Puppetry. Uh, she has taught me so much of what I know and also passed on just a really healthy work ethic of you know you just do the work and you um, and you just always help people Um, and so I really look up to her and finally if uh, there's so many people but one more Um, so after the Randwick Puppet Festival oh coinciding with it there was the Sydney Festival on yeah and we went to see Ronnie Burkett Um, who's from Canada, and he did a show, Forget Me Not, and I (laughs) described... What a show. show. Yeah. What a show. Uh, Changed my life. (laughs) Yes, and that's exactly exactly it, is he really 
pushes the envelope of what you can do as a puppeteer and as a performer and interacting with the audience and doing something really bold, deeply personal and to put people outside of their comfort zone and really let people in. Yeah. Um, well, for, for context, what he did was he actually had a, a, an assistant for two years build 120 odd individual hand puppets uh, hand carved or with uh, paper mache and every single member of the audience was given what they he called an other uh, which is a puppet that we had to hold up at various moments and interact with Ronnie while he was operating either the marionette or another puppet of the of that kind such as a hand puppet and it, he had these great command t- terms like puppets rise or light me and mm-hmm or maestro, and he would ask us to be the light and sound of his show while we sat in sort of a theatre of the round context. But it was almost like it was a a 1940s lounge uh, that he sort of had us kind of congregate in. And we were allowed to move freely throughout the show and, uh, and, and really be the masters of our own experience. It really did change the game of, of, of how you can make a puppet show happen, hey? Mm, I think giving the audience agency mm-hmm. and also making yourself as a puppeteer really vulnerable and asking for help, it sort of reminded me of an amazing TED talk that Amanda Palmer did about asking. Ah. And at the, just the power of asking and opening yourself up because it's a very vulnerable place to be, to not be in command of the music and of the lighting and of the sight lines, but to invite people in and to say, I need your help. We're going to create this together. Yeah, it and creates a beautiful relationship. And I think, you know, when we, we're, in, uh, we're at a point with puppetry where we really need people to have a go. And so yes. Ronnie didn't even ask. He was like, hey, you guys are having a go at puppetry and you're going to like it, you know. <laughs> and I really liked the tenacity of that as well, for yes. sure. And I think as someone who is a pioneer in Canada of puppetry, uh, the fact that he had the, the guts to, to, to do that was yes. really wonderful. And I want to go back to what you said about Richard and about how we need to document um the puppet journey that has happened in Australia. Do you think it is a well-documented history? I think some parts are well-documented. So there is a book, and unfortunately I can't remember who wrote it, but it's called Theatre of the Impossible, and it does document um, different puppeteers, um, and I can't even remember what date it was written but uh, I have a feeling it would you know it, it should probably have covered at least from the 1970s to the 1990s I'm, I'm imagining and that was a hardcover book uh, that was written um, with beautiful photographs that you could just go to and go who are the puppeteers in Australia and in order to keep this industry going I think we not only need more puppeteers but we also need people to document the puppetry that's happening and so uh, yeah it's it, it but I think it's also the form is changing so we have podcasts like this all right you know we have um, social media we have websites handspan uh, puppet theater um, uh, which disbanded many years ago they have a website that has a lot of information of the work that they used to do. And so it still lives on in that way. And they took the initiative to pull all that documentation together themselves. But I do think it would be wonderful to have another publication um, just to, you know, pull together who are the puppeteers in Australia. And perhaps, oh, you know, I'm... I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but this is the 50th anniversary of Unum Australia. Maybe we could be a part of making that happen somehow. Mm. So any designers or writers or documenters or librarians or whatever we need to make a book about puppets and puppeteers in Australia, holler at us, talk to us on on Instagram. Um, so Kay, we're getting towards the end of the conversation. So I wanted to ask you, where do you see yourself going in puppetry and what was the biggest moment for you? Where do I see myself going in puppetry? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think the dream that I have, and it's, it's always a bit scary to say a dream out loud when it hasn't happened yet, but the dream I have is to continue Caroline's legacy of the London School of Puppetry and actually to 
you know have a puppetry school in Sydney oh, um, and that be to amazing? you know and and to keep sharing the joy of puppetry um, with people who simply just want to learn so that's something that I would love to do and I would love to keep doing what what I'm doing now I still cannot believe that I get paid to do what I do to hmm. make puppets to perform uh, to to run workshops it's such joyful work so if I can do that for as long as possible that is a great way to live but I also work as a primary school teacher as a substitute or a casual teacher and so my art isn't the only thing that has to feed me which is also great um, but uh, what was your other question again where do you oh uh, well, your biggest moment oh my biggest moment I have okay I have to be quick because the conversation's any I have three okay three okay. big moments okay. in puppetry oh let's quick. go one two three okay okay so number one going on play school Oh, ABC wow. Television's Play School, that was pretty big. On their episodes on puppetry, it was their Through the Window segments, and they had come to film uh, when we did the Malden Puppet Carnival in Victoria a few years ago. So that was a really special moment uh, being showcased there. Um, another, number two, is making dragons, making big dragon puppets with my dear friend and fellow puppet builder, um, Catherine Hannaford for the 2017 New South Wales School Spectacular. And that's a showcase of performing arts by over five and a half thousand students from public schools in New South Wales. Mm. And our largest dragon was about 15 metres long. Yeah, it's a big so dragon. that was a big achievement and I'm really proud of what we did then. In a 10,000 seat arena, mm. you know, it was a big deal that and show. It was, and that was televised and so people around the country got to see puppetry as well and it was the um, first time that a drama ensemble had been included so it was a first on many levels so that was really exciting and my last thing is uh, creating puppets and performing at the Sydney Opera House with the show The 13 Story Tree House based on the children's book series by Andy Griffiths and Terry Denton and performing at the Opera House was just a really really special experience and I'll never forget it. Well, Kay, yes. as a puppeteer who's done all those amazing things, what advice do you have for young puppeteers, performers or builders working in Australia today or in the future? Well, I have uh, someone that I have in mind um, that I'm speaking to about this because there is someone who contacted me uh, only a couple of months ago in this exact position. She is an aspiring puppeteer, she's young, she's a uni student and she did one of the first things I would recommend anyone to do which is think, uh, search for puppeteers in your area, contact them and you know, we, I'm going to tell you in advance, we're really nice, we won't bite um, and just say you know what you like about their work or, or um, you know can you go and help with any shows volunteer you know I, I said before I'm half Japanese when um, when young people are learning how to become a sushi chef the first thing they do is they clean floors for you know the first couple of years and just watch and observe and you know I auditioned for War Horse I knew that I wasn't going to get in um, and I went with Kayla Cabanas but I just saw it as an opportunity to see how these puppets worked and the way their audition worked is you watch and you observe and you learn by watching others you know and this was an audition where they were looking for high levels of stamina physical fitness and athleticism I have none of those qualities but you know I could watch and I could learn and just to take in that experience and I think um, I've mentioned volunteering so um, you know, even though the Randwick Puppet Festival has passed, there's the Melbourne Festival of Puppetry that's coming up and it's between the 30th of June to the 5th of July. So it's in the Victorian uh, school holidays and, you know, contact them. It's run by Lemony S, S for Sam Theatre, as well as uh, La Mama Theatre and see if you can volunteer or just go go and see the shows you know see shows and and meet puppeteers and meet people and um yeah just give things a red hot go yeah that's it going to just say. get involved hey yeah. we are a, a humble bunch and we certainly do want more people around us more people to come to puppetry mm. so now okay before we go mm -hmm. i was wondering yes would i be able to have a little chat with chi chi if that's okay i've got some questions to ask her oh okay so um you want to talk to my monkey i, I really want to talk to your monkey if that's okay is she here is she, she she's asleep you're gonna oh. have to wake her up okay well, let's try and wake up chi chi oh. <laughs> chi chi 
Chi Chi, wake up. Chi Chi. Where am I? Oh, oh, oh. Are you in a little booth? Hello. Oh, oh, hello. Oh. Hi. 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 Nice to meet you, Chi Chi. I'm Pete. Oh, hi, Pete. Hello. Oh, it is, it is such a pleasure to be in this little room with yellow walls. It's very yellow, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is so yellow. It's not really on brand, is it? It should be an orange room, but we'll work on that later. Um, if anyone remembers the great series of the 90s and noughties called Inside the Actors Studio with James Lipton, he would ask his guest, Chi Chi, a yes. final set of 10 questions. So oh. I've got some questions for you. Is that okay if I ask you these questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. So you got to answer the first thing that comes to your head, all right? So you can't think about it too much. Bananas. Uh, okay. Well, that, that, they have to answer questions first. Oh, sorry. Okay. So Chi Chi. Yes. What Bananas. Is... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. You go. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm too excited. Chi Chi, what's your favorite word? Bananas. Okay, we got that far. <laughs> Chi Chi, what's your least favorite word? Uh, well, it, it, it's a combination. The bananas are gone. Okay, so gone. 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 No more. No more. Oh, Kaput. Dear. Zilch. Nada. <laughs> Any more no words? Vast emptiness. The abyss. Chi Chi. Yes. What gets you excited? Bananas. Oh, gosh, this is going to be a boring interview. Um, <laughs> what's another way of saying these yellow fruits that you can peel and, and they hang on trees? I just really like bananas. That's okay. You can like bananas. Oh, but, but you know, it's, it's what you can do with bananas. Banana souffle, banana spaghetti, banana pancakes, banana candy. Oh, banana. Split. Bana banana split. Banana Chi -chi, split. come on. Split. Banana gymnastics. Oh, my wow. goodness. There's so much. Wish there was more do. time to ask about banana <laughs> gymnastics. It's the uh, splits. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> that was great. It was a Another fun. little fantastic moment. I had to put it in. I'm so sorry. No, I am not apologizing. I am not ashamed. What does not get you excited, Chi Chi? What does not get me excited? What, what makes you really just bummed out? Well, I kind of said it before. When there is a place and there's just no bananas whatsoever, you know, and, and when you meet people who just don't eat them and you're like, what's wrong with you? You know, like even if the banana is old and wrinkly and brown, you make banana bread. You know, that right. is the go to. Be They're, sustainable with your bananas. Be sustainable people, you know. So, you get know, it together, people, folks. people who just don't get it, who just don't go bananas over bananas. Yeah, well, th that is the same. Uh, what sound or noise do you love? Plop. Plop? Plop. Do you know what? I'm not even going to question that. What sound or noise do you hate? Oh, what sound do I hate? Well, I'm quite accident prone. Okay. And so I fall over a lot and I cry a lot. Oh. And so I do not enjoy the sound of my wailing and my tears and, you know, my inner rage that comes out. Okay, let's let's say that. It's quite primal and primate. <laughs> <laughs> That's two. And Sorry. what is your favorite curse word? Oh, bother. Bother? Yeah. I had to do it with an American accent. Bother. Okay, great. What profession, other than your own, of being a chimp, would you like to attempt? Oh, my goodness. Well, I would love to go to a banana farm and be one of those people that get to pick the bananas and then take them to the people. Could you help yourself? Could you actually oh. get all those bananas to the people? No, because I'd eat them first. I haven't yeah. thought this through. No, you haven't. I haven't. I oh. But perhaps we can ask you this question. Maybe that will narrow it, narrow it down for you. Okay. What profession would you most not like to do? Oh, what would I not like to do? Well, I'm a monkey, which means I don't have opposable thumbs. So anything that requires, like, texting, <laughs> you know, with thumbs. And I also have buttons for eyes. So anything that requires, like, really good vision... <laughs> You know, so um, those kinds of things I probably would not do. Or a brain. I have, you know, like stuffing. Like I literally have stuffing in my brain. So nothing really academic. So nothing really academic, no texting, and no like, you know, 2020 vision. Well, I had that help you narrow it down. Yeah. Yeah. I got one more question for you, Chi Chi. Sure. JJ, this is a pretty intense and philosophical question. Bananas. So are you ready? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. If heaven exists, uh -huh. what would you like to hear God say? when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, I would like him to say, well done, 
good and faithful servant. The bananas are over there. <laughs> Chi Chi, that was amazing. Well done. Thank you, Thank you so for much. your time. Can I have Kay back? Is that okay? Okay, Kay. Kay, he's back. He's, he said come. Okay, okay. Thank you, Chi Chi. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Kay. Hi, Thank you for bringing Chi Chi back to us. You're welcome. And thanks so much for talking to us today. Um, where can we find you? Okay, so I am on the interwebs. So my website is paparoos.com. That is P for Pete, like you. Hello. U, double P for Pete, like you. E R double O S for Sam dot com. Uh, I also have Digital Seagull which is the company that I do for, um, you know, projects for adults and corporate clients. Fantastic. So that's digitalseagull.com. And I'm on Instagram at K underscore, uh, one of those underscorey things, yeah. Yusugi. So K-A-Y underscore Y-A-S for Sam, U-G-I. So you can do that. And if you want to find out more about Unima, that's www.un for Nelly, I, M for Mary, A, .org.au There you have it, folks. Thanks for listening with us today, and make sure you subscribe for more great puppetry arts and practitioner interviews. I've been Pete Davidson, that puppet guy, and we've been talking with Kay Yasugi. Kay, thank you so much again, and we'll see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, Pete. Bye. Thanks for listening. Now we want to hear from you. Each week we'll post a series of questions related to every interview. Join the conversation on Twitter at TalkingSockCast. You can help us bring puppet power to the podcasting world by hitting subscribe, liking our socials, and telling your friends. Like us on Instagram at One Orange Sock Productions and check out our episode blog at oneorangesock.com. You can support our podcast by pledging to us on Patreon. Your support helps fund our audio mastering, interview transcriptions, and much, much more. Find the link in the podcast notes and earn yourself a shout out on our socials. Head to our website at oneorangesock.com or talk to us on Twitter to see how you can show your support. Our music is composed by Elizabeth Maniscalco and our cover art is by Chad Vanier. Without them, this podcast wouldn't be possible. We'll be back next week with another great episode here at Talking Sock.